Hello, everyone. I'm here today talking to my friend, my newly met friend, Narayan. We spoke also with his wife, Mukti. The two of them live in Serbia, and they run a center for master in Serbia. So, Narayan, how nice to see you. Narayan, if you could talk to us a little bit about um, what, how you grew up, who you were as a child, sort of what your character was when you were young, before you met Master? Um, well, I grew up in a family where my father was <clears throat> a devoted communist, mm. and my mother was, um, well, I wouldn't say religious, but just following the tradition that is, um, that is prevalent in, in these areas. And, um, I didn't have much, let's say, spiritual training mm -hmm. as a boy, um, but I did learn a lot about integrity and honesty and fairness also. Um, what I remember about my childhood is that most of the time I felt happy. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, I try to go back and remember why why, why, why did I feel happy? Was it because of, you know, some happy memories? But most of the time, it's not. I, I just was happy. And then I would, I would remember specific days or specific situations because of that feeling and not the other way around. Huh, interesting. Huh. Um, and then um, at the age of seven, my father died. He had lung cancer and he died. So only my mother, my sister, older sister, and I uh, left. And at that moment, I felt I had to be an adult. I don't know why, but you know, I was the only man in the house, in the household. So I had to be strong and mature and everything. But I still felt happy, even though it was a struggle for a while, but I still felt happy. And at about the age of 12, I discovered martial arts, huh. um, karate to be more specific, and then later on some other martial arts. Um, and they gave me, um, they felt familiar. I, I never thought I was athletic. I never thought I was, you know, very um, physically competent. But at some point when I started doing karate, I just felt this, I've done this before. It's all so familiar and the discipline and the concentration and, you know, hard work and sweat. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it also introduced me to the Eastern way of thinking, to the Eastern philosophies, Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, mm -hmm. primarily. And um, through, martial, through martial arts and Zen Buddhism, I just started you know, digging deeper and deeper. And... Um, I studied, I went to, we have a, let's say, um, specialized high schools, and I went to a language high school. Oh. So my first, my first language was English in high school. My second lang language was Russian, but you could, you could also have an optional language. So I chose Japanese. Goodness. I suppose, <laughs> I suppose there's some, some scars from, from the past that included karate and Japanese and so on. So, so I decided to study Japanese. Mm -hmm. And with the Japanese language also came the Japanese culture and so like, you know, philosophy and everything. And as you go further back in the past, there's also Chinese, the Chinese philosophy and, of course, Indian philosophy. So you had to help the, look at the whole package. Mm -hmm. And was, it, was this motivated? Were you, I mean, you spoke of yourself being happy. Were you searching for meaning or did it just kind of like come to you and you woke up to it? I was searching for meaning, yes. I always liked to, to understand, I always wanted to understand how things work. Uh -huh. And I just wanted to, to understand how life works, how this world works. You know, why do you have to be born and then die? Why do you make a car and then it breaks down? Uh -huh. You know, why don't things last? Uh -huh. So I just wanted to figure things out. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing led to another. Um, and I decided to study Japanese at university. Uh -huh. And that is when I met Master for the first time. 
How did he come into your life? Um, well, there was a, a, a magazine dedicated to different martial arts, uh -huh. but also to, to different uh, Eastern teachings like yoga and uh, even origami, you know, just to, to, to uh, make Eastern philosophies and their culture closer. Uh -huh. And there was a little section you know, you, you pull, pull the middle of the, of the magazine out, you cut it up, and you make it into a little booklet. Uh -huh. And I have no idea what it was, but it was fascinating. Uh -huh. There was this tiger swami. There was this, you know, what do you call him, scented swami or something. Uh -huh. um, then there was this uh, chapter about the cosmic consciousness. Wow. And I said, wow, I would like to do what this guy Mukunda does. I remember that exact thought. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it, it was in that was that was in 1995. Uh -huh. um, and then I started my studies, and I learned about Buddhism and you know Taoism and whatnot. And then um, after I graduated, Master came back uh -huh. to remind me of my you know you remember when you said that you would like to do what I did. Uh -huh. so, and how, um, did he, how did he come back? Um, <clears throat> he came back through a friend. First of all, I have to say, I never, I could never say before that, I could never say, actually before 99, I could never say about myself that I was religious. Right. Um, because I was always skeptical. I see. I wanted proof. I couldn't just believe. I wanted experience. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever I heard, and I have to say, I have very keen mind, and I just tear it apart. And if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't work, I just don't, can't accept it. Um, but at some point uh, after the bombing in '99, um, actually during the bomb, during the bombing, I just felt so safe, mm. so protected, and so calm that I just couldn't explain it. Where did that come from? Mm. And after a while, I just had this sort of revelation, if I, had, I can say it like that. It just, everything made sense. Mm. And first it came through, let's say, intuitive feeling. Mm -hmm. And then slowly I managed to put the puzzle together. Mm. And then I realized, if I can learn all these things like languages and martial arts, and yet never become absolutely perfect, mm. who was you know, who was the perfection itself? Where can I find it? And then I, I suppose I started asking the right questions. And then um, a few years later, a friend of mine... Isn't, isn't it interesting? You know, having your country be bombed is such a terrible thing to have happen. And yet it catalyzed such a deep experience for you. Is, isn't life confusing? So, <laughs> okay, so and so now now you're asking the right questions, but also probably being pushed so far as to be in a, a such an insecure, it pushes your mind to places that it wouldn't go unless you were pushed, and your spirit too. Oh, so now you're asking the right questions. So so but go on with what you were saying. And then different books come to me mm -hmm. uh, from different parts and traditions, mostly Indian. Mm -hmm. um, but then a friend of mine who, who at the time was a member of the Hare Krishna movement, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he came to me and he said, you know, I think, I, I, I have to say this, I loved going to their uh, satsang and their kirtans because it's so much fun. Mm -hmm. But they would all sing and dance and, you know, bounce, bounce about. And I would <laughs> still and enjoy it, but I would be very still and you know, just meditating. And they all called me, you know, the, like the film, The Little Buddha. Because uh -huh. <laughs> I'm short. I'm short. And I also sat quietly. So uh, I, was, <laughs> I was known in the, in the Serbia, in the Belgrade Hare Krishna uh, group as The Little Buddha at the time. Um, but he said, you know, I have a book that I think just suits your vibration. That's exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a photocopied um, a copy of, of the autobiography of a yogi. Mm -hmm. And 
But before that, I have to say, he just showed, showed me, because at that time there was a, 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 a published book, Scientific Healing Affirmations, mm -hmm. in Serbian. Sorry, I'm just trying to, to think of the English words. And before I started reading autobiography, I, I had a look at the book, at the uh, Scientific Healing Affirmations, and I opened the book and on the first inner page there was Master's Picture. Mm -hmm. And for five minutes at least, I just couldn't take my eyes off that picture. Mm -hmm. And I kept staring at his eyes. And it's one of his earlier photos mm -hmm. when I suppose he just came to, mm -hmm. um, to America. And I found it later on the internet and sometimes it is titled as uh, Angel Face. Oh, I remember, I remember thinking, if angels do exist, they must look like this. Oh my goodness, isn't that interesting? Yes. Mm. And I remember, I remember that gaze. I remember those eyes, and I just starting started. Um, well, I didn't cry because it wouldn't be dignified, of course, mm. in front of my friend. But I really felt like crying, of, you know, out of happiness. Um, and then I started reading autobiography, and then I remembered there was this Tiger Swami, and there was this chapter on, you know, um, uh, cosmic consciousness, mm -hmm. and all these things. But I have to say, the most impressive chapter uh, from way before was the meeting, the chapter about the meeting be between Master and Sri Yukteswar. Oh, they met, and exchange of affection and deep love that's what actually what actually moved me the most but I'd forgotten that mm. and when I read the you know, when I read the book again I remembered it mm. I said what oh, this was this is what I was looking for mm. and then master just started you know started calling me literally calling me louder and louder mm -hmm. and after a couple of months later um, Gordana, who Mukti mentioned, came from, from Croatia, mm -hmm. and a friend who organized the group here from, from a nearby town, uh, he called me, invited me, and that's how it started. And that's how it started. So, so then, um, let, let's just be practical for a moment. What work do you do? What were you doing with your life at the point that all of a sudden master is the middle of your life now? Were you out of university? Were you into work at that point? I was, I was doing my um, postgraduate studies at the uh -huh. moment. And your study in um, Japanese? Yes, but I, I quit that because uh, I had hopes that I could work at university teaching Japanese uh -huh. philosophy and culture, but that didn't work out. So I just decided not to pursue you know, my postgraduate studies. No, I don't need a degree if I'm not going to do anything with it. I see. So, 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 so I, I, I had a university degree, but I didn't need a master's degree. I understand. So uh, you, you entered into some kind of work at that point? What kind of work did you do? I did work at university uh -huh. um, as an administrator, trying to get into, um, to, to become a teacher, to get into teaching. Uh -huh. but as it didn't work out. I also had to go to do national service. In Serbia at that uh -huh. time, you had to do a compulsory uh, military service. So I had you're, to stop. You're already aware of master and then you have to go into the military. Is this right? Is that what yes. You're yes. So how did, I mean, were you, were you able to keep master with you through that or did you just have to put it on the shelf for that time? Oh, yes. Well, actually master guided me through the whole experience. Um, well, I couldn't meditate, of course, because there were like 90 of us in the same, um, in the barracks, yeah. sleeping together, um, 90 men snoring and, you know, <laughs> yes. uh, but, um, but I said, okay, master, you know, I have to do this. I didn't choose it, you know, but you have to be with me. Uh -huh. I didn't know much about, I, I had been a disciple for a while. But I didn't know much about discipleship. You know, it was just a, um, it was just a start of our relationship. You know, and I just said, okay, let's just go there and see. You know, see how it goes. Uh -huh. um, and I remember my my senior officers kept telling me, um, 
you always seemed very confident, like you've been, you know, in the army before, in the military. <laughs> and, of course, but I had master, and I just said, okay, you know, even even if I go to hell, I'll take him, and he'll save me. He'll save how marvelous! So let's um, go forward, and then you also you. When did you meet Swami Kriyananda? Where did you meet him? Uh, well, it was what Mukti said, two thousand and six, I think, uh -huh. for the first time. It was um, it was about his eightieth birthday. I see. Uh -huh. And he, there were loads of people, and that was the time when we just went and lived in the community. We didn't take uh -huh. any courses or anything. We just spent two weeks living with with the community. How did it feel to you to suddenly? I mean, you were more or less. You didn't have a community where you were living, and all of a sudden you're in this community with all these other people. How did that feel to you? Absolutely normal. Normal. Like, <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, I really felt um, at ease and at home from the very first moment. Like this is it. Of course, on on the outer level, you had to get used to you know things how things are done there. Of course, mm -hmm. and all these different languages being spoken, you know, yeah. while you're doing the dishes and everything, but. Um, Inside, you could just feel that okay, this is home. This is where I belong. Um, and it hasn't changed since. Uh -huh. That's so wonderful. Um, but since there were, you know, there was about, there were about 200 people then. Uh -huh. So we just kept quiet and just enjoyed the atmosphere. But uh, we couldn't, as Mukti said, we couldn't actually understand how great Swami was. Uh -huh. um, and I have to admit, and I hope Swamiji will forgive me, that I said, why are they you know, making all this fuss about him? You know, isn't, isn't Yogananda our master? Uh -huh. Of course, it took, it took me a while to understand why he's so important. And now I'm so grateful for what he was uh -huh. and what he is still, of course, because he's, uh, he's just not present in his body. But he's present, um, and then it took a while to um, to understand that. Actually, the first time I felt his real greatness was in two thousand and eight when we were in America, uh -huh. and not. I remember uh, we, he gave us satsang of, of about an hour, and I, I I sat like two meters from him, uh -huh. and of course I listened to him attentively and and watched his face. And he was beaming with joy and peace. But what a friend of ours said later actually, you know, reminded me of, um, sort of put it in words for me. She said, if I only came, if I'd only come for this hour here, it would have been worth it. Mm -hmm. And I said, exactly, my thoughts, exactly. Mm -hmm. And because I really felt accepted. I think that's the word that I would use. Mm. You know, I was just enveloped and accepted, enveloped in his aura, and you no, know, like you're mine, you're here. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, in 2011, he was recording, at that time, he was recording some 20 minutes programs. Mm -hmm. It was in a CZ. Mm -hmm. And I remember Shivani just sent us. Uh, to his house. We were doing a uh, Raja Yoga teacher training course mm -hmm. and she said, you guys, you go and listen to Swamiji teach. Uh, not teach, but sorry, uh, record. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there mm -hmm. with my eyes closed and I have no clue what he said. I don't remember a single word, mm -hmm. but I just felt, um, I just felt happy. Mm -hmm. Just being there was a very thrilling experience for me. Mm -hmm. And then I actually started getting really who he was mm -hmm. um, and why everybody um, loved him and respected him so much because mm -hmm. of what he was able to give them. Yes, it's because um, of what you feel like in his presence. It's not him. It's what you, it's what you feel like, what a person feels like in his presence inside themselves. That's, the, that's what the magic is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and... Yeah, and so. And so now, um, what uh, you have, you're, you, you mentioned you were taking the Raja Yoga teacher course. 
So you've taken some responsibility for bringing Master's teachings back to your country now? Yes. Well, we, we started, I personally started teaching her at about 2007, in about 2007, because mm -hmm. that's when Gordon and I handed over uh, leading of the group to us. Mm -hmm. And because um, a number of our members at, the, at the, that time didn't speak English or didn't use English very well. And we did. Mm -hmm. So we brought a lot of books and recordings and so on and so on. So we would just read and listen. And, you know, we were, we were in contact with Shivani primarily, but, you know, with Assisi. So we were sort of a, the bridge between our members and, and the teachings and Assisi, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how I started teaching. Just, you know, I read this. It sounds interesting. So, you know, so my first lectures were, were meant for our members uh -huh. in a circle, the people who already meditated and knew what, it's, what it was more or less all about. Um, and then in 2015, uh -huh. so we'd been a, a group that just met every week for a couple of hours and then we would go home and it was just relatively close, let's just say. Mm -hmm. and. In 2015, I just felt, I don't know why, I just felt we have to, you know, reach out. We have to try and share this with, with many. Mm -hmm. And we organized a couple of, uh, a series of uh, public talks. Mm -hmm. And there were like 30, 40, 50 people. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was a huge success. And from that, that moment on, we started actually developing. After that, we got uh, our center. Well, we didn't buy it, we, we rented it out, but... Mm -hmm. um, so what do you feel is the essence of the message of Master that you're commissioned to share in the center that you have? How do you, how do you feel that? First of all, I, I don't want people to think that we are just another yoga studio. Mm -hmm. You know, because we are here for something more important. Mm -hmm. We're not here for ourselves. We are here to share what Master gave us. Mm -hmm. And well, I remember listening to to a talk by Swamiji, and he said, "You don't have to be perfect to share these teachings. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a little bit of peace, share that peace. If you have a little joy, share that joy." Mm -hmm. uh, or a little bit of realization, share that realization. Mm -hmm. So I don't have much peace or, you know, I, I do have quite a lot of joy, I have to say, <laughs> but I don't know how much realization and, <laughs> and other qualities I do have, but whatever I have, I'll just give it, you know, I'll just share it. Uh -huh. um, because it's not mine to give. Uh -huh. I myself can't give much, but with Master and Swamiji and all of you, uh -huh. you know, behind me, uh -huh. We can give a lot. That's very. What kind of people come to your center? I mean, do, are you? Is there? Is there a character? Are they young? Are they old? Or are they just from all, all possibilities? They're mixed, uh -huh. but lately, I think younger people have been more attracted to uh -huh. to the teachings. Mm -hmm. um, younger meaning, you know, younger than me or around my age. Mm -hmm. um, which is which is nice, you know, because with younger people you also get fresh energy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and lots of ideas. You know, so. your country has certainly been through a great deal, and and the whole world right now, because this is May twenty twenty, we're all just in this very strange transition. How do you feel that Master's teachings will contribute? Um, as we sort our way through this year, next year, and the years to come? Well, I know that Master's mission is global. Mm -hmm. And I know this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I also know that people are looking for answers. They're looking for purpose and they're trying to make sense of you know of life that's not you know doesn't make much sense very often um, 
and master's teachings are not just logical and coherent and nice to listen to, but they are very practical. Mm -hmm. And we just hope that um, we are able to share that all those blessings that we've received mm -hmm. and just maybe, you know, touch those who are ready and just say, okay, there are some blessings there and maybe that's what I'm looking for. There's some joy and some peace and some understanding. Maybe that might be my, my path. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll just, you know, soldier on and you know, don't do what we can. As, as a disciple, what, what does it mean to you to be a disciple? Everything. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I don't usually... I also taught uh, in, in the same school uh, as Mukti. Uh -huh. And last, last June, I lost my job. Mm -hmm. um, you know, interpersonal um, misunderstandings, let's just say that. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, of course, there's this brief moment of insecurity what am I going to do now we have a little child and how are we going to support ourselves but then I this very clear uh, insight came that said you are not your job you only did your job and you never defined yourself through your job but that was I, I mean I knew that in theory but I never had that experience and then I said, but well, how do I define myself? And if I have to define myself as, as master's disciple, maybe not a very good one, but still here I am and, you know, I'm holding on to him and I'm not letting go and he's stuck with me. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen the film Risen. It's about uh, Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, I don't remember. I don't think so. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter. At some point, this Roman soldier who, who is um, little by little transformed by the whole experience of Jesus' death and resurrection, resurrection, he speaks to St. Peter. Uh -huh. And Peter says, you know, after, uh, after Christ resurrected and visited them and talked to them, and he says, okay, now you go and preach. Uh -huh. And um, Peter just says, you know, after all this, after, after all this, how can I do anything else? Mm. And, I, and I said, that sentence basically says, uh -huh. you know, oh, how can I do anything else? How can I be anything else? That's perfect. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Narayan. I really enjoyed hearing your story. It's unique, of course, to you and to my experience. And I, I wish you every blessing on the work that you're doing, both in your own hearts and in those people that you serve. So God bless you, my friend.